Were you there? What a perfect song. Well, we all were there because Jesus Christ died for all of us. We're all sinners saved by grace. There is none righteous, no, not one. But if we believe in Jesus Christ, then all of that unrighteousness is taken away. We are justified in the sight of God. We are His children and we can cry out, Abba, Father, because we belong to Him. And we have a security, a home permanently in heaven. Have you ever thought of yourself as Barabbas? We are. Scripture says he was an insurrectionist. That's exactly what we are against the kingdom of heaven. We gathered together in an uprising and said, I want my will be done and my kingdom come. Don't I have a right? And sometimes we say that even especially as children of God. I have a right. No, we gave up all rights to ourselves when Jesus paid the price for us. We deserved hell for all eternity. Whereas you read earlier, the worm that eats the flesh in the flames never ever dies. We deserve all of that, but Jesus took our place so that He could love each and every insurrectionist here that rose up and said, no, I want to be my own God. And He gave us freedom. He set us free. Or we can continue to live the way we lived. We can continue to struggle and try. Or we can say that we're saved and we've got our fire insurance. Or we can say, I'm free to give up my life and serve Him who died for me. If anyone will come after me, they must deny themselves, take up their own cross, and then follow Jesus. Do you believe Jesus and His message? Are you choosing Jesus or are you choosing Barabbas? The crowd chose Barabbas that day, not because he was a thug. There's a lot of other reasons involved. Peter chose Barabbas that day when he denied knowing Jesus when he called down cursings from heaven so that the people would understand, I'm ashamed of following Jesus. It cost me way too much. But yet Jesus went silent before his accusers because no man has authority over him to take him to the grave. No man can kill him. He could have called down a legion of angels, whatever. But he laid down his life willingly because he knew that was the will of the Father to save each and every insurrectionist in here. The question is, do you believe his message? And do you choose him or the things of the world? Do you choose Barabbas? (coughs) Turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 15. We're going to look at that scripture. And remember, I don't think... Barabbas was a thug. And I'll tell you why in a little bit. In verse 1, very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders and the teachers of the law and the whole Sanhedrin made their plans. What does our say? Reached their decision. I can barely read that. I've got to get glasses for too long. They had pre-decided they wanted their will be done. They were tired of this guy who did nothing but good for the people, claiming that he was God. Jesus may never have been taken to the cross if he didn't say the bold things that he said, that he was God. How blasphemous. How crazy. Unless you are God unless you can rise from the dead. Because I'm going to tell you, any other religion that has any leader, they're dead. They're in their tomb. But Jesus rose again, and that's part of the the thing that drove the Messiah is they saw Jesus again alive. Then the power of the Spirit came on them. 
If you didn't catch that in your reading, Jesus stayed with them walking in the flesh for 40 days, giving them convincing proofs before He went to heaven and, and called the Spirit down. And they walked with Him in boldness then without the Spirit of God because they saw a risen Savior and Lord. They were able to do it on their own might and power. Not as good, granted, but they walked on their own power and might simply seeing their Lord crucified and risen from the dead. Because who can do that except God? <clears throat> so they made their plans. And I'm going to say this again, and you might find it offensive, and it's so good. That was the church. That was who people came to to find out the law, to see what they needed to do to inherit eternal life. Jesus' teachings was much different than what they were. And as we read on, they see that they did their plans out of envy and jealousy. Now, I don't know about you, but don't you want justice? <laughs> That's something we talk about in Bible study sometimes. I want justice. Or do I? I think I'd much rather have grace. Jesus got no justice that day. He was mistrialed. He was sentenced to death without the proper proceedings. And all because another man who thought he had power over him, Pilate, was scared of the crowd. So Scripture goes on to say, <clears throat> they made their plans, so they bound Jesus led him away and handed him over to Pilate. Now remember the story about the Roman centurion and, and knowing what authority was and everything? The Jews recognized their authority. Their authority was Rome. But they didn't recognize their authority who was God over everything, did they? They couldn't see that the mighty miracles done were from God. And Jesus had been clear about that when He said, I can forgive sins. And I'm going to prove it to you by get, take your mat and get up and walk. Because you can't do those things unless God is with you. And here this prophet is claiming to be God who has fulfilled all these messianic prophecies. While the, where the disciples did leave John the Baptist or left their things behind, Matthew left his tax collector booth behind, and they followed after Jesus. But they couldn't do it under their own power because they were scared to death of what it would cost them. But when they saw Jesus raised from the dead, they got a little courage. And when they got empowered by the Spirit, they became mighty men because they were new creations in Christ. Verse 2 says, Are you king of the Jews? asked Pilate. Asked Pilate. You have said so, Jesus replied. Maybe he made an offense to Rome since he said he was the king. But that's not a capital offense. Verse 3 says, The chief priests accused him of many things. So many different things that they could not validate or anything else. False accusations that we should be properly tried for. They were still false accusations with no merit. Verse 4, So again Pilate asked him, Are you not even going to answer then to defend yourself? Human nature calls us to scream out for justice. Wait a minute, these proceedings are wrong. Wait a minute, I'm innocent. But yet Jesus was quiet because he didn't need to speak out. He was God. No man can judge him. He did no wrong. Pilate went on to say, See how many things they are accusing you of? Verse 5, But Jesus still made no reply, and Pilate was amazed. Or maybe yours says marveled. He wandered in admiration. Because if you read the other accounts you'd see that Pilate longed to meet this Jesus because the miracles Jesus did weren't in the dark. They were for all the public to see, for the world to see and decide whether Jesus was who He claimed to be or not and whether they would accept His message or not. And even Pilate longed to see who Jesus was because he had to figure this out for himself also. <clears throat> and he was amazed that Jesus would not even speak up to defend himself. Because he thought he had authority to kill Jesus. Now he's wondering to himself, who is this guy? I don't, do I have authority over him? And if you read in the other accounts, you'll know that his wife had a vision and so forth. 
But he was amazed that Jesus would keep quiet. Verse 6, we changed the setting a little bit. It was a custom at the festival at Passover. Was it Pilate's custom or was it the people's custom? We don't know. But if you read Scripture, you'll know that the Jews came to Pilate and requested. So Pilate at least honored their festival. I don't think it's because he was scared for them because there wasn't that big of an uprising. He had enough soldiers to take care of these smaller uprisings. And that's why Barabbas and his buddies were in jail in the first place. And the, here was their outcome. They were either going to be flogged and then released. And if you know anything about that, that's, I mean, if you survive that, that's amazing. Or they were going to be crucified to set an example. You know what that's going to do? That's going to stop any insurrection. But you know, that's not what God does, is it? Instead of giving us the punishment we deserve, we still have oxygen to breathe, don't we? We still have a place to go home to and food to eat. And my, when we look at that, how rich we are in this world. Knowing that all of that comes from God so that we can be rich and merciful for others who don't have as much. Why? So that we can tell them about Jesus. We can continue on the gospel message. As Luke writes in Acts, it's the, be the beginning of the works that Jesus did or continued with us. The things that Jesus taught and did, the apostles kept carrying on and on and on and on right to this very moment today. <clears throat> so it was a custom at the festival to release a prisoner whom the people requested. Release him from what? from that flogging that could take his life, and very likely would, or from death. Pilate had the power over them of death in his hand. And Jesus was in Pilate's hands. <laughs> or was he? So they would be, have a criminal release to them. Now when you read that and think about that, why would you want a criminal released? unless it was an insurrectionist in the first place that was rising up against Rome because we want to be freed from this authority that's over us. Just like we rise up on our own because we want our will to be done instead of God's will be done. So see, this guy wasn't necessarily a bad guy in the eyes of the Jewish people. He was somebody that screamed out, will you turn that off for me? I didn't silence my phone. That was Chewbacca going... Rrr. So here was this insurrectionist who was saying, free my people. But he was put into captivity, chains, jail, whatever you want to say. And he was going to be punished because he had fought against the Roman authority. So in the eyes of the crowds, he may have been kind of a good guy. So they had to come to him in request. And if you read, you'll see that they were swayed to request Barabbas from the religious leaders again. My, how sad. And when I read that, that makes me think of Jesus' words, you're either with me or you're against me. You're either gathering people for the kingdom for all eternity or you're scattering. How could the church have swayed the people to go against this man who had done nothing but heal them and feed them, who did mighty miracles by the actual finger of God. How could they turn against him? Unless, in my heart, I want a different kind of Savior and Lord in the first place. I want to have my Savior, but I still want to be Lord, whatever it is. I don't think they could have just swayed them. If that's the case, these pews would be full. <laughs> People still make their own decisions, and it, was, it looked good for them to have Barabbas released instead of Jesus. Then why? Well, let's read on. <clears throat> A man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the uprising. Now, when you read about the thieves on the cross, and I hope your Bible doesn't have thieves, but maybe it does. That's a bad word in our translation. They were infidels is what the better word is. 
bad men. They did things that were bad against the law, against the people in authority, against the laws of God. Even though they might have had their best interests in heart, so they thought the wisdom of man is foolishness to God. So they thought by their might and their, their power they would overthrow the Roman authority, even though Rome had conquered the world. Even as Joe J Jacob told us before, Romans had made the inner structure of streets and roads and things that would allow people to carry the gospel to other places. That the language that everybody did recognize was Greek, even though they had their own, so that the gospel could be carried, even without the gift of tongues, to the known world, because this empire had conquered the world at the time. He was in prison with the insurrections who had committed murder in the uprising. He was in jail for committing crimes against the authority, which was Rome, where he had yelled out and been violent, and it had led to murder, saying, we Jewish people want to be free. Now, that doesn't paint him as a thug so much, does it? It paints him as a kind of a local hero. <clears throat> Verse 8, the crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. This was his custom. This was ordinary. They would request somebody. He would honor it for whatever reasons, and he would let an insurrectionist, a murderer, whatever, go free. But I guarantee you again, I wouldn't let this guy that was killing my own family free. I'd choose someone else. But I might be led to let this insurrectionist free because he's shouting freedom for me. And this was a time of religious zealots and so forth. In fact, there were some disciples that changed their way of thinking and became followers of Jesus Christ. So the crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what they usually did. Verse 9, Do you want me to release to you the king of Jews? Pilate asked. He thought right here he'd found no guilt in Jesus whatsoever. Here's my chance to set Jesus free. Surely the crowds will want them because I already know the only reason Jesus is here is because the religious leaders were envious of him. That's obvious. The crowd knew that. So he said, Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Must not bother him too much that he labeled himself as king. Must have not thought it was a threat because Jesus had done nothing but good in his life. Verse 10, knowing it was out of self-interest or envy that the chief priest had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priests, so even the leaders, the elders in the church, stirred up the crowd. Remember what we told you about Jesus? Come on, don't you want Barabbas instead? They stirred up the crowd to release Barabbas instead. Release a man that was properly tried, that was, tried, that was guilty of his crimes, deserving of death because murder had occurred. A life for a life, right? Verse 12. What shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews? The one who had never had an uprising, who had never committed murder who never even had hatred in his heart, which Jesus said was committing murder, who had never done any crime that Pilate himself found no wrong in him. Not only one that wouldn't murder, but would give up his life for you instead and let you murder him. Verse 12, What shall I do then with the one you call king of the Jews? Pilate asked. Their answer in verse 13, Crucify him. And mine has an exclamation point and then says they shouted. Crucify him. Crucify Jesus. The one who has healed us and fed us, who has done no wrong, who has been improperly tried, who has been put here because of the envy of the religious leaders. Crucify him. Verse 14. Why? Why? What crime has he committed, asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder. I'm not going to get louder, don't worry. Crucify Jesus. Verse 15. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, so even he doesn't have the power that he thinks he has, does he? Even he doesn't realize what he is doing. There is no justice here whatsoever. 
Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. I'm going to ask you again, don't you want justice? <laughs> or in this case, do you want grace? Because if justice had been served that day, Jesus wouldn't have went to the cross and died for you and I. Peter, again, going back to Peter, said, no way, Lord, are we going to let you die. He's the one that cut off the ear more than likely of the, of the servant. He's the one that would fight, but yet he had just denied him utterly because he was scared. I don't know about you when I'm reading that. I don't look at Peter again as someone who was less than. I look at, oh, Peter's a human being just like me. So it gives me some hope when I do things against my Lord and cry out and dishonor Him, but then know that I can come to Him and ask forgiveness and mean it. And He will accept that because He's cast my sins as far as from the east as from the west. He knows I'm still a human being. Paul said, why do I continue to do the things that I choose not to do? And those words are penned towards the end of his life. He struggled with it all of his life because we still fight a battle against the flesh and against the Spirit. So what do you think Peter's thinking at this point? I mean, he's crushed. His hopes were in Jesus. He's denied Jesus. Now, if Jesus was who he said, he's going to serve for the same fate in his mind as Judas did. He has no hope. Well, when you read in some of the others, other Gospels, you'll see him reinstated by Jesus. You'll see that Jesus never tells him, you know, you let me down there. Instead, he says, if you love me, feed my sheep. If you love me, feed my sheep. If you love me for every denial, feed my sheep. As you went into Acts, you see that Jesus said in verse 7, It is not for you to know the times or date the Father has set by His own authority. I always read that verse first before I read verse 8 so that you know you don't have to have all the answers. What you do need to know is that you have the power of God if you are His, if you have been born again. And the power of God resides in you, so you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. You will be in your hometown of Jerusalem. You will be in the outlying areas of Judea and Samaria and you will be to the utter ends of the earth. Because this is God's plan that He made before you were ever even in existence. This is what He formed you for. This is why Jesus died. So that you could be His hands and feet. That together we could be the body of Christ. If you read on in Acts chapter 2 verse 7, it says, Utterly amazed, they ask, Aren't all of these who are speaking Galileans? Because this is when the Holy Spirit has come upon them. There's that word amazed. It's the exact same word that Pilate was amazed when Jesus kept silent. But guess what? The people aren't amazed now at the silence of the disciples. They're amazed at their boldness to preach the gospel message. And on top of that, because of the power of the Spirit, everyone there can hear and understand in their own dialect. And there are people from all over the world again so that they can hear and they can go take the gospel message on the roads that the Roman Empire had built. Wow! If you keep on reading in Acts chapter 2, verse 14, ah! Then Peter stood up with the eleven. He raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, because that's what they thought, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this was spoken about by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people whose sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. Everyone will prophesy. If you are a child of God, you are sanctified through and through as you read this Bible. Why do you think I push it? 
the Spirit will bring these words alive to you and reveal the Word that was made flesh and dwelt among you so that you will understand who Jesus is, what He has called you to do, and He will equip you and sanctify you with the Word and the Spirit till you become more and more and more like Christ. If you will deny yourself, take up your cross and follow after Him. Verse 41, those who accepted His message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to, that num to the number that day. Wouldn't you like to see 3,000? Well, let me tell you this. Our Wanna's program is going to be bigger than our church before long if we keep serving, if we keep focusing on that, if we devote it to prayer and make it a goal, if we become the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. We had 41. We had 51, if you notice in your bulletin on Sunday. They're closing in. <laughs> Praise God. And we do need some men in there. <laughs> Not just women. And we need to pray, pray, pray that God continues a mighty work. The church was born that day. And what did the church look like? Jesus. You know, there's a Sunday school lesson because everything's about Jesus. And this little boy was in there one day and I've told this before, if you heard it, sorry. But they said, what takes nuts and puts it up in the tree and stores them up for winter and everything. Come on, somebody. But you know every Sunday school lesson is about Jesus, right? So the little boy said, it sure sounds like a squirrel, but this has got to be about Jesus, right? Just the thought that the children know that they come to hear about Jesus and that you're going to tell them about Jesus Man, I think I heard another brother say that sometimes he doesn't feel like by the end of the day coming, but he always gets a blessing after coming and serving his children. If you read on in Acts chapter 4, verse 32. Oh, spoiler alert, I'm taking you further ahead. Let me go to Acts chapter 2 first, verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together. They had unity and they had everything in common. They sold property and possessions because it didn't matter to them to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of the people. And the Lord added to their numbers daily those who were being saved. That's what the church looks like. Notice I didn't say looked. That's what the church looks like if in fact we are being the church. Then in chapter 4, if you read on, so spoiler alert, you'll get there Tuesday, you will be introduced to a guy named Barnabas. Oh, there's got to be a reason. That's close to Barabbas or Barabbas, isn't it? I'll tell you more in a second. We find out about him in Acts chapter 4, starting in verse 32. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own. But they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them that there were no needy persons among them. None. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them. They brought the money from the sales and they put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas. He sold a field that he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. This is the same Barnabas, who was the cousin of John Mark, who wrote our gospel. This is the same Barnabas who went and got Saul when he saw the people at Antioch acting like Christ and the crowds calling them Christians, little Christ, because they were mocking them because they looked so much like Christ. But Barnabas said, this is the coolest thing ever. Let me go get Saul, not knowing that then Saul would take over as Paul and start leading, but he gladly stepped down because he knew that we doesn't matter who's serving. I hope Jacob becomes a greater man for God than his father ever was. 
I pray it every day that he doesn't waste as much of his life. That he sees the importance that I can teach that to our children. And another reason we need to focus on our Awana's ministry. But if you notice, it says here Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. That's because Bar means son. And then Anab, I'll say it that way, means son of encouragement. Well, if you study a little bit more, you'll see that that's a different form of the word paraclete. Paraclete is the word that Jesus said, well, I will not orphan you. I will send you the comforter or the encourager back to always be with you. And here's this guy whose name is Joseph that the disciples called son of comfort because he was so much like the Holy Spirit in comforting them that they recognized it and called him by another name. He was that to the apostles and to everyone else. So now let's take that back and study it a little bit. I'm going to Matthew 27. Starting in verse 15, we have the account of Jesus before Pilate. And let me give you a little bit of input here. This is right after Judas's denial of Jesus. But we know the difference in the outcome of Judas and Peter because one repented and one did it. Matthew 27, 15, Now it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time they had a well-known prisoner. Well-known. Jesus was well-known. Barabbas was well-known. They just went about things totally different, did they? One went, by, one went by the flesh, one went by the Spirit. <clears throat> Whose name was, what does your scripture say there? Does yours say Jesus Barabbas? Uh-oh, what does Jesus mean? Same name as Joshua, same name as Yeshua, but in the Greek it comes over to us as Jesus it means that <clears throat> salvation is from God. Literally, it means Jehovah is salvation. Mark writes that this guy's name is Jesus Barabbas. Jehovah is God, Bar, Son, Abba of the Father. This man is Jehovah is God, Son of the Father, Son of God. He is an anti-Christ. Now, when I say anti-Christ, I know a lot of times you guys think the end times and everything, anything that is against Jesus is anti-Christ. The people saw Barabbas as a savior. And they took being saved by their own power and own might over being saved by Jesus' death. They didn't see it coming. They didn't understand that. But that day they chose Jesus Barabbas over Jesus, the promised Messiah, the Christ. Don't we do that? Don't many days we try to do things by our own power and our own might, what seems reasonable to us, instead of dying so that we might live? Again, I'll quote Scripture, but Scripture says the foolish... The wisdom of man is foolishness to God. We do plan our own things, but so many times they're wrong. They saw a Savior who was leading them to victory by uprising against Rome compared to a Savior that said, Die, submit yourselves to have eternal freedom. So I don't paint him as a thug. I paint him as so many times the decisions that I would make given the same circumstances. That I would look at what's here rather than walking by faith. I see all the things around me and I make my decisions off them instead of getting on my knees before God and praying to Him and asking His will be done. So I'm going to push you a little bit more this year in prayer too. 
Because that's the pattern that Jesus set. That's what he did in the garden right before this. So that he would know the Father's will because he knew what he was facing in the flesh was going to be hard. But he knew what he had to do. He even asked that God would take this cup of suffering from him. But no, not his will be done, but God's will be done. Verse 17, So when the crowds had gathered, Pilate asked them, Which one do you want to release? Jesus Barabbas? Or Jesus, who is called the Messiah? <laughs> Pilate laid it out there, facts. Do you want this fake Jesus? Or do you want the real Messiah? The real Messiah has called you to a life of servitude. A life that says, I will deny myself. A life that says, not my will, but your will. But also a life that says, you will be raised up in glory with Jesus the Christ. Verse 18, For he knew it was out of self-interest that they had handed Jesus over to him. When Pilate was sitting on the judge, judge's seat, his wife sent him this message, Do not have anything to do with this innocent man. For I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. A little glimpse of suffering for one day compared to all eternity. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and have Jesus executed. Again, I wonder what I would have done that day. I see what Peter did that day. Verse 21, Which of the two do you want me to release to you? asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus called the Messiah? They could have still said here, release Barabbas and just whip Jesus. Release Jesus also. Because Pilate wanted to release Jesus. So don't miss that point. Not only did they cry out, release to us the one who looks right in our eyes as Savior, but we want you to destroy the other one. And praise be to God, that was His plan. That we didn't sway any of that by what we thought would be right. But Jesus willingly laid down His life. Pilate had no authority over Him so that you might live. The crowd answered, Crucify Him, crucify Him. That's why I put the title of this message, Who Would You Choose? Because I know, if I'm honest, that many times I've chose Barabbas, what looked right, but wasn't. And I've done it out of self-interest on top of that. <laughs> Does Jesus' death for you mean everything to you? Because that's the next part of the story. Jesus' death did mean Barabbas' freedom. And it means freedom for any insurrectionist who chooses eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So are you living a life that shows that as well? Will you choose Jesus? I mentioned to you there were two disciples, apostles, whatever you want to say it, mentioned just prior to this. Judas and Peter in two different accounts. But Judas would not repent and ask for forgiveness. Peter did. And look how God used him. Jesus died so that you could spend forever and ever and ever with Him in eternity. Will you choose Jesus today? Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you for your word. We thank you that you did release us so that we could live for you. Father in heaven, we just praise you for your ways are so much mightier than ours. Lord, we pray that you examine our hearts. We pray that you give us the strength to, to walk by faith. Increase our faith, Father. As we come to you, Scripture tells us that you're not hidden from us. You give us your word. You give us the Spirit. You ask us to come to you and make our pleadings and our thanksgivings known to you so that you can bless us more and more because we are your children 
if you would send your only son to die so that we could be children also. Wow, what love that you must have for us. Father, we thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. So I probably don't think about doing communion as much as I should.